Okay, I think we will start. Uh, we have a packed agenda for tonight, so we'll try to start here on time, and we're going to do everything we can to be wrapped up by 8.30. My name is John Cook. I am the chair of the Diversion First Stakeholders Group, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it has been uh, longer than we had anticipated uh, getting back together, uh, uh, and we had also hoped to get back together in person, but um, that's just how things go sometimes. But we're glad to be here in this format. Um, we will be getting back to our intended every six month meeting schedule. We are planning a meeting in the fall. We are hopeful that it will be in person, but like everything else, we will have to see. Uh, but we hope that this format is helpful to all of you to be able to still stay connected to each other and to us and to participate tonight. Um, all of you should be muted at this point by our administrator. Um, we have something like 100 people scheduled to be with us tonight. So uh, we need to do it that way. But if you have questions, you can type them up in the chat um, and we will try to get to them as things go along or at the end. And if we can't, we'll be able to get back to you uh, privately. There is a uh, discussion time uh, later in the meeting um, on topics as well. So to, um, to talk about the uh, format for a minute, um, we will have um, standard updates so that we can bring you up to dates on the highlights of what is going on, uh, somewhat longer presentations on the trespassing deferral pilot, uh, the uh, treatment for opioid use uh, disorder, and uh, I've covered my screen. There we go. And reentry, recovery supports, and our co-responder team updates. We have a featured presentation on the market alert, uh, Marcus alert system, which continues to, to evolve, and we continue to work with it. Um, and then we will have breakout groups. There will be four breakout groups, and you will be able to choose which one you will be in. Each group will be different. Uh, will be different and will address four different questions, two of those questions related to Marcus Alert and two of those questions related to kind of the future needs of the diversion effort. So we'll get you those specifics at the end when we're ready to break into groups, but just to kind of get you oriented, um, we'll ask you each to uh, join a group and then stay in that group for 15 minutes of discussion and then we will have report outs uh, at the end and then uh, a, a closing session to, to chat about where things are and, and where we are going. Um, one note about the breakouts. Um, we ask that um, if you go into a breakout session that you please uh, put your video on so that people can see each other's faces uh, unless you have a, uh, an issue where you cannot do that, but we have we found in the past that people are more comfortable engaging in discussion if the video can be on. We, we know we have some, some county staff and perhaps some community members that kind of want to, you know, want to sort of monitor or just sort of go in and out of the breakout rooms, which, which we might do if we were in person, but we find that does not work particularly well uh, in this format. So we ask that if, you, if you're if you gonna go into a breakout, you stay and you participate. And if you don't wish to participate in a breakout, that's fine. You can stay right where you are here. And when we're in the breakouts for 15 minutes, you can simply go go blank and, and, and have that time off and come back for the report outs. We'll touch up base on that again when we break into, into those groups themselves. Um, but for now, I think I will turn it over to our esteemed leader who does all of the work for us, Lisa Potter, our director. Thank you very much, Lisa, and take it away. Thank you very much, John. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Potter. I'm the director of diversion initiatives for the county. And what you see right now is the sequential intercept model. I think everyone is familiar with this, but we show this graphic in just about every one of our meetings because it's been so critical to all of the services that have been developed or enhanced services at each intercept point, and you'll hear more about um, services along that continuum this evening. 
There are many diversion first programs along this model. And the model is really a framework for identifying points to intervene with people with mental illness, substance use disorders, and developmental disabilities to break that cycle of criminal justice involvement. Just as a quick reminder, there are six intercepts. Intercept zero focuses on community services and includes things like crisis call centers, mobile crisis units, co-responder teams, and other services to intervene with people at the earliest possible stage of a crisis. Intercept one is focused on law enforcement and involves a specialized law enforcement response and diversion is an alternative to arrest whenever possible. Intercept two involves initial detention and includes efforts such as court supervised programs instead of incarceration for people who have a pending trial or court date. Intercept three focuses on jails and courts and includes services like specialty dockets, which you'll hear about tonight, and jail-based programming. Intercept four is, is re-entry and really involves transition planning to prepare individuals from release from incarceration and provides linkages to community supports. And finally, intercept five is community corrections and it includes parole, probation, and community-based services and recovery supports to reduce recidivism. So we're, we're, you're gonna hear about services and programs all on this continuum. As John mentioned, we have a packed agenda. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first presenter is Judge Tina Snee from General District Court. And Judge Snee is going to provide information on a new trespassing pilot program, as well as an update on the mental health docket. Welcome, Judge Snee. Good evening. So I am going to talk about two diversion first programs. The first is a, a new program, and it is the trespassing deferral pilot program. This uh, began in the General District Court on March 1st of this year. It is a cross-agency program, which includes the Sheriff's Office, the Police Department, the Magistrates, the Court Services, Community Service Board, ASAP and OAR, the Commonwealth's Attorney, the Public Defenders, Defense Attorneys, and the Court. And what we've come up with is a pilot program, and it's based on the current resources of all these agencies. What we determined was uh, trespassing was a charge that we could start with in regards to this deferral pilot program. Why we chose trespassing was for a number of reasons. Trespassing is a class one misdemeanor in Virginia with potential of jail time. It's often a charge that has mental health or substance abuse as part of the underlying parts of that case. And uh, we wanted to address that as well. It often involves people with housing insecurities. It also says it also often involves housing insecurities. It also involves high utilizers for services or those in need of services. It's also one of the first charges someone gets coming into the criminal justice system as an adult. It also can have individuals who are both high risk, uh, high risk and high need, but also people with low risk, low need. And we want to be able to defer them out of the criminal justice system as quickly as possible. If we could change the slide. So in regards to the program, an individual who opts into the program at, after being assessed for their needs can have their charges both dismissed and expunged under this program. What they have to do is they have to, for six months, uh, work on the assessed um, tool, the assessment needs, such as a mental health assessment and following the treatment, a substance abuse assessment and following the treatment, uh, connections to housing, education, community service, general good behavior, uh, and employment. Whatever their needs are, they have to work on those, and those are assessed by a, a tool through court services. The goal is that once they've succeeded in regards to that, they get the benefits of both having the services for uh, lowering recidivism, but also get the charge dismissed and expunged. We started this program on March 1st and 55 people have already been assessed in regards to that program. But the goal is, as we pointed out, is both a, uh, a carrot in the sense of getting the expungement, getting the connection to services, and also having everyone there to help, having all the services to help you towards success. If someone is not successful, they'll return to court um, for help in 
giving extra time to get through it, or they will be adjudicated under the regular criminal justice system. So we'll give you more information as we go forward as to um, how many people successfully enter the program, how many people uh, do the program and the assessments. And we're gonna do the program till the end of this year. And the second program that I'd like to discuss on the next slide is the mental health docket. So the mental health docket has been in existence in Fairfax County for three years, and we just had our fifth graduation. We had four graduates, and that took our total number to 18. Uh, it was great to have uh, former Chairwoman Sharon Bulova speaking as our guest speaker. As, as we all know, she started Diversion First or the concept of Diversion First in 2015, and it was good to have her there. Uh, we have added to that program during the last three years. We now have an alumni group, and a lot of our alumni both participate in the group, but also come back to our graduation, which I think shows the good connections that they made through the docket. We also have a, a peer group that's working with us through Arm and Arm, and they come both to the mental health docket, but even more important, they contact our individuals in the community and are working with them in regarding to building relationships. We also have a new treatment coordinator as our docket coordinator was doing two jobs. And with a treatment coordinator, we can actually uh, get a connection to treatment for these individuals who are all high risk and high need. We're very lucky that uh, in regards to the graduation, Julie Carey from NBC had uh, come and talked to us before we started the program and circled back right in time for graduation uh, and both highlighted our graduation on Friday, but also one of our graduates from last year. We're going to try and play that if, if the technology permits, and here it goes. Some of the people in our community who suffer from mental health challenges go through a cycle of getting arrested and then landing in jail. But Fairfax County is working to change that that with a special court program called the Mental Health Docket. News 4 was first to tell you about it three years ago and now first on 4, Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey checked back to see how it's working. When Josh Gintero was honorably discharged from the Marines back in 2000, he was already facing mental health challenges. That, along with addiction issues, led to repeated arrests and likely jail time. But his attorney mentioned a new program in Fairfax County, the mental health docket. He said, you have options. You don't have to go to jail. You can, you can do this program. I was desperate to, to get some help. So, so that's what I did. The mental health docket began in the summer of 2019, aimed at providing treatment instead of punishment. Our target population is individuals who have a serious mental illness diagnosis, and it's individuals who have also um, been found to be high risk, high needs. Meaning a high risk of reoffending if they don't get treatment. High need means first providing services. They have all of the needs. Um, they need housing, they don't have health insurance, they don't have food, they don't. So psychiatric stability is something that's probably pretty far down on the list when it comes to their priorities, when they don't know what they're gonna eat tonight or they don't know where they're going to sleep. Judge Tina Snee oversees the docket and says that first step is crucial. Um, that makes them start to trust you because that's a very important part of recovery. Treatment plans are developed next. There's group therapy, individual therapy. For Josh, it meant examining past traumas, changing his behavior. It kind of forces you to take a look back on where things may have went wrong, what you could have done different. It is very hard work, but there are rewards sometimes at the very regular and mandatory visits to Judge Snee's courtroom. There's an incentive wheel they can spin for prizes. But the biggest payoff, graduation, like this one today. Most of the participants spend one to two years before they're ready to leave the program. Of the 38 people on the docket so far, 18 have graduated and just four dropped out. Everything's exceeded our expectations. It just really has gone very well. So. Thank you, Michelle, for making it easy to tell on myself. And while success means no jail time for graduates, Josh says the true payoff is his newfound stability. Um, my level of gratitude is that I have like a second lease on life. I'm, I'm able to move forward. And moving forward now means Josh is enrolled in college working toward a degree. In Fairfax County, I'm Julie Carey, News 4. Some of the people. 
Thank you very much, Judge Snee. It's wonderful to hear about all of the developments with the dockets and also about the new trespassing pilot. So thanks so much for all of your terrific work. Our next presenter is Laura Yeager, Director of Correctional Health and Human Services for the Fairfax County Sheriff's Office. And Laura is going to share some information on treatment for opioid use disorder and re-entry recovery support. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. It's a little hard to follow that uh, great report and news story. That was exciting to see. Um, I'm going to speak with you a little bit tonight about um, some happenings at the Adult Detention Center um, that our Sheriff, Sheriff Stacy Kincaid, has really um, pushed forward. And um, we have started since July of 2020 treating people who are incarcerated or who come into the jail for opioid use disorder. Um, Part of the reasoning for doing this is that jails are mandated to treat chronic disease and we're looking at, um, at opioid use disorder as a chronic disease, which makes it a priority in our healthcare system in the jail. Um, that has been a big cultural shift for both our medical staff and our confinement staff to start looking at, at addiction as something um, beyond a choice or beyond a moral failing, that it really is an illness. Um, there's been a lot of stigma busting as we've gone forward. Um, we handle the prescribing and the treatment through um, the medical branch because we're there 24 seven. And the CSB staff who are based at the jail um, provide behavioral health supports in addition to the medication. We start to plan at booking. Um, we've introduced uh, many, many evidence-based approaches um, to, to doing this uh, and we're, uh, you know, we've changed all of our practices in how we treat people. Uh, in the past, before July of 2020, someone may come into jail and have a very difficult withdrawal. We're finding that um, not only are people in jail having um, very humane withdrawal processes, um, we have a cleaner jail, we have a better behaved jail, and um, we're able to continue people on their medication and treat them throughout their period of incarceration, which is different from many jails. Um, as hard as that process is, and I could talk for an hour about that, how, how that's been to stand up, the real key to what we're doing is um, to look at solid reentry supports when people are getting ready to leave. We start to plan for that um, as people are coming into the jail. We have excellent partnerships with the Chris Atwood Foundation, um, as well as the Community Services Board. Um, the, the Chris Atwood Foundation provides peer support services, as does the CSB and their vital partners to us. Um, the CSB clinical staff uh, provide those behavioral health supports as well. One of the things that um, Sheriff Kincaid has really um, put forth in her thinking and values and philosophy is that treatment really works and recovery is possible. Next slide. Just a quick look, and Ellen Volo has helped with some of the, uh, these, these, uh, this information. Um, to give you an idea, if you look on the right side, um, really the number of um, opioid fatalities in our health district in Fairfax um, in 2021 was 111. We're, we're finding that uh, we're treating, we, you know, we are screening, uh, we treat about one in 10 individuals who are incarcerated at the jail. And I just did a rough calculation today. We're treating, um, I believe, 69 people um, with for opioid use disorder um, in the jail. That's a, um, just a little bit over 12% of our jail population. So the need is there um, and we're really excited about it. Um, if we are able to change uh, those lives, uh, um, 60 people, um, if we can change their lives, you can imagine what we can do with the overdose um, death rates in Fairfax County just by treating folks while they're incarcerated. Uh, we also need to look at um, continuing their treatment with reentry. So our peer support staff, um, we have reentry staff at the jail also support um, people leaving, um, leaving the jail to connect with jail uh, community-based um, treatment with the CSB or other providers. We also have small scholarships for recovery housing, um, telephones, because we it's easy to lose track of people. We've installed a phone charging station in the, uh, in the lobby of the jail. So when people are exiting, they can charge their phones if they have them. Um, the list goes on and on of those kind of um, supports to link people uh, to community-based services and natural recovery supports. Next slide. 
Okay, this is my favorite slide in the whole world, um, but what does the future hold? And really, if we're gonna continue down this path, which we are, we know it's effective and we know it's a time in people's lives when they're most vulnerable, but we can help them, um, is to really normalize medications for opioid use disorder in the community. And this guy who looks really cool uh, is talking about, this is from a national campaign. Um, my doctor helps me manage my asthma, my acid reflux and my opioid use disorder. So, you know, the vision for the future really is to look at um, a, a robust um, health and behavioral health care community that people can access help uh, in a non-stigmatized way that this just becomes part of going to your doctor. So that's a quick snapshot of what we're doing at the jail for opioid use disorder. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks for sharing such great information about the really innovative and life-saving work that the team at the Adult Detention Center and Sheriff's Office is doing. So thanks so much. And our next team, next we're gonna hear from Abby May, Director of Emergency and Crisis Services, and Lieutenant Morrow with the Fairfax County Police Department, who will provide an update on the co-responder teams. Thank you, Lisa. So since we last met, I wanted to give you some updates on our co-responder team. As you may remember, our co-responder team consists of a CIT trained law enforcement officer and a crisis intervention specialist that are riding together, responding to 911 calls for service in the community. In September of 2021, we had a six week pilot of the co-responder program, which resumed operating in September. The team uh, recently expanded the number of days to five days a week, uh, operating Wednesday through Sunday, and shifted the hours from 12 to nine to two to 11, so they could increase their response availability to later calls that are coming in in the evening. Police and CSB leadership have implemented monthly meetings to, including the field teams, to discuss operational issues and program improvements. In addition, the field team has started their own internal monthly debrief to share lessons learned. The co-responder team has also created an internal referral process where they can provide follow-up outreach and, and engagement to individuals in between 911 calls when they have downtime. And recently the CIT co-responder law enforcement, um, co-responders from law enforcement provided a two hour training to our co-responder CSB staff on law enforcement tactical safety and response procedures in the community, as well as the physiological and psychological responses to high stress and traumatic situations. This was really helpful for our CSP staff to provide more insight and understanding and awareness when responding with law enforcement in the community. Next slide, Lisa. So as far as data so far, as of May and 20, or May 14th, that we've had 195 responses. One of the great successes about co-responders so far is that over 60% of those calls are able to be de-escalated in the field without further law enforcement action. Over a third were diverted from potential arrest and hospitalization and sent to resources in the community such as CSB services, private treatment, uh, substance use uh, treatment facilities, as well as shelters. Approximately 19% were placed under an ECO, and 68 of those responses occurred in residential settings, with the second most common place being responding to uh, public spaces. So now I'm going to pass it to Lieutenant Morrow, who's going to talk more about the demographics of the individuals served, as well as our expansion efforts. So as, as Abby noted, as of mid-May, the co-responder team has responded to 195 events. These graphs show some of the demographics of those who received services from the team. As you are looking at these, it is important to distinguish that the vast majority of these calls are dispatched uh, events and not self-initiated calls. These events are in response to family members, friends, coworkers, classmates, neighbors, and the general public calling 911 and requesting help and services. After the call is received, the county's dispatch center has determined that a law enforcement response is necessary. All right, next slide, please. So as it stands right now, 
we have one unit deployed in the field and the goal is to increase that to four. We have spent a considerable amount of time and effort building data tools to help us measure and track the effectiveness of the unit. These efforts allow us to look for trends, adjust our operations and develop best practices. Our unit deploys in unmarked vehicles to better provide services to some of our consumers who may initially react, react negatively to engagement with law enforcement. And this has been very successful. Traditionally, each organization has trained its own respective employees. And um, Abby mentioned one course that we just completed, um, but we are also working to develop a joint training program in which the co-responders, both on the law enforcement side and the clinical side, would train together. Marcus Alert dictates that we develop an advanced crisis intervention training course. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that at this point, because we're gonna talk about Marcus Alert in a little bit, but I will tell you that this course is in development and the inaugural running will be later this year. I'll pass it back over to Lisa. Thank you very much, Abby and Lieutenant Morrow. And it's really exciting to see the co-responder team take off and, and continue to expand. And we look forward to hearing the next updates. Thanks for all your work. Our final presentation for the evening is a team effort. And our presenters will be talking to you about a Marcus Alert update. Um, when this stakeholders group met last, May, we had sort of an introduction and orientation to the Marcus Alert, and a lot of work has been happening over that time. A lot of new um, guidance has come out, continues to evolve. So the team is going to provide a bit of an update for you tonight. And on our team, we have Daryl Washington, Executive Director of the Community Services Board, Redick Morris, Strategic Planning Manager from the Department of Public Safety Communications. Laura Clark, the director of PRS Crisis Link, and you'll get to hear from Lieutenant Morrow again from the Fairfax County Police Department. So I will turn it over to the team. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Daryl Washington, Executive Director of the Fairfax Falls Church Community Services Board. It's great um, to be here with you virtually this evening. So the David Market Peters Act um, was passed into law in 2018. Um, the drivers behind that was with a biology teacher killed by Richmond police during the midst of a mental health crisis. It became law in 2020 and then was amended, amended in the most recent General Assembly session. And what essentially it do, does, it requires um, the local public safety, PSAPs, 911 call centers to partner with law enforcement, local behavioral health providers, um, as well as um, crisis call centers um, to set up a triage system for individuals that are experiencing a behavioral health crisis um, in the community. And it does include a state plan for implementation. Next slide. Um, so the, the plan allows for the implementation to be tailored uh, based upon local resources and local needs. Um, but some of the requirements are um, really the goal to divert those individuals that are in the midst of a mental health, behavioral health care crisis away from 911 to either a crisis call center or some type of co-responder unit, which could look like a mental health professional responding in the community. It could be a mental health professional, as well as a law enforcement officer or a co-responder response, as well as a mental health professional and a trained peer specialist in the community. Um, so there are a number of different directions the co-response could take as it relates to that. And then the goal is to have a systemic way that those type of triages um, are done based upon um, the needs of the individual on the other end of the phone. Um, one of the other goals with that as well is to basically set up a voluntary database that community members can share ahead of time um, and have entered into the database if they have critical health needs and behavioral health or developmental disability information that they want first responders to know about prior to being dispatched to the location. 
the next slide, please. So our goal right now with our local strategy is that we want to align our current efforts to the spirit of Marcus Alert and use available resources wisely, looking at the things that we already have in place that are strengths, um, the co-responder pilot that we have going on, our community response teams that are in place, and all of the efforts that we've done over the past multiple years to, to strengthen our Diversion First program within our community. And this is going to take collaboration across the board um, with the Community Services Board, along with all of our law enforcement partners, law enforcement partners, um, our city localities, um, in our in our locality, our 911 call center. Um, it will take collaboration between all of us in order to pull this off and make this work. Um, and we want to remain flexible, um, given that we are by far the largest locality in the Commonwealth. Um, the way the plan is stood up here is going to look different than the way it's, it's stood up in other parts of the Commonwealth. And we want to make sure that this plan is tailored um, to our needs. Um, so it's the flexibility for some localities have been pushed out up to 2028 statewide, but we are really now targeting having our protocol set up um, by July of next year. Um, and then really, as we stand up those protocols and strengthen those efforts, um, much like we did in Diversion First, using lessons learned um, as an ongoing process to um, strengthen our Marcus Alert and our crisis services system. Next slide. So just a quick picture. Um, right now, if there's someone in a behavioral health care crisis, um, up at the top, the current system is that they would call 911 and they would get some type of public safety response. Um, and just to add another layer to this diagram is another way that folks can get calls for service right now would be to call our, Mary, our now Cheryl Villain um, Health um, site and get access to care. There are also regional crisis services where people can call. So there are a number of different avenues right now. And our goal with Marcus Alert and strengthening our crisis continuum is to really have a streamlined um, one way that, that someone can access care. And then we're doing the triage behind the scenes and making sure that the appropriate response is given, the appropriate level of care, by the appropriate individuals and in providing those behavioral health care service, whether it's the regional crisis call center, whether it's a co-responder unit, whether it's an officer, whether it's an EMS unit that is responding to the individual needs of the person on the phone. And with that, I am going to turn it over uh, to uh, Mr. Reddick Morris to be able to talk about the voluntary database. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl. Rebetic Moore, Strategic Planning Manager with the Department of Public Safety Communications. One of the first pieces coming out of the House Bill 5043 for the Marcus Alert legislation was the establishment of a voluntary database. That database will be made available to the 911 alert system and Marcus Alert system, which would provide mental health information, emergency contact information for an individual who may be in an emergency crisis. So with this Fairfax County, we, we looked at a couple of options for us. One was Smart 911, came with a price tag that uh, was six figures. We also have a product that's already in place within our center called Rapid SOS, which was at zero cost. We leveraged a tool in there, which is referred to as the emergency health profile. Within that profile, <clears throat> individuals are able to go in uh, based off of a, of a phone number in which they would be calling from and put in information as it related to any type of behavioral health or emergency medical events, at which time if individual calls into our center, uh, that information would pop up based off of a flag on a map that we have here. Um, and it will, if it's necessary, based off of the call for service that has been made, we can take that information provided within the event itself and provide that to the responding emergency services resources that are in route. <clears throat> That process that we put in place, we put it in place in June of 2021. So we met the, we met the uh, implementation date of July 1, 2021, which has now been amended within the legislation to July 1 of 2023. With that, we've done a few community outreach efforts uh, through uh, Department of Public Safety Communications, the Office of uh, Public Affairs, as well as CSB, where we've uh, used social media, uh, Facebook, as well as uh, 
uh, other plat platforms as well. And we've put that out there for folks to, to encourage folks to sign up. We all most recently did an another one on Facebook Live, uh, myself and Steve McMurr, our IT administrator uh, here, uh, working with OPA again. And we're looking to do it as well in Spanish language. And we do encourage folks to go to our homepage uh, and look us up. And uh, if you wish to fill out the health profile, it's an emergency health profile. And uh, feel free to fill it out. If you have any other questions for us, we're always here, 911, 24 7, 365. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Laura, Laura Clark. <laughs> I'm Laura Clark, and I'm the Senior Director at PRS Crisis Link, and I'm um, so thankful to be here tonight to kind of thread the needle between what's happening with 988 and the Marcus Alert um, in, in our region. So um, there's a little confusion about what 988 is, but it actually it's just the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and it was a designated new code, um, similar to 911, it's 988, um, that was authorized by the FCC. And this is some of the biggest uh, suicide prevention and mental health legislation of our time. So this authorization um, is bringing new funds and um, highlighting new services, but also requiring states to provide uh, structure to how the lifeline service is delivered in their states. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is actually about 200 local centers like PRS Crisis Link um, that have been locally funded and operated, um, bringing local resources to their communities versus a national call center, which doesn't really understand the mental health systems in local communities. Um, PRS has been operating as a lifeline center for many years and operates within 85% of the state. The big news is about what's happening in July. And um, on July 16th, 2022, um, 988 is going to be officially turned on across all carriers of every phone provider in the nation. What it doesn't mean is that um, the service is necessarily ready. This is the first part of implementation of 988. Um, and it's really critical to kind of understand what it means. It's not a go live of every um, center is at full capacity. It's simply that FCC requirement is occurring um, this year. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the next phase of that, but that's what's happening this July. Next slide. So, the Marcus Alert that we're talking about does require this regional crisis call center. And what we're trying to do is the Lifeline kind of operates outside of the public mental health system in most states, and it generates a ton of calls, chats, and texts of individuals who are in crisis who generally need to be connected to additional behavioral health resources. So by building these regional crisis call centers, we're integrating 988 into the larger system. It allows for um, 988 to have a strong relationship with 911 and have a bi-directional relationship through Marcus. So 911 can transfer calls to 988 and 988 can transfer calls back to 911 when an emergency needs uh, law enforcement or emergency response. Um, Marcus Alert is way ahead of where the federal process is. So Marcus Alert will, is occurring now whereas 988 will not likely be marketed until next year. Um, so PRS Crisis Link, which has been in, um, in Northern Virginia for over 50 years, operates the Regional Crisis Call Center for Region 2 um, in Fairfax County and for the Marcus Alert System. So we are integrating 988, our Regional Crisis Call Center, um, and local numbers into this one system. So next slide. What's really awesome about what's happening, aside from this really great piece of legislation that comes with funding, which is awesome, is that we're developing a common language to assess people and to determine what is the best option for this individual in crisis. 80% of the calls coming into the lifeline in the regional call center um, are routine situations, which an individual is provided support, connected to care if needed, um, but really resolves at that level. Um, the other 20% require um, a response that might be mobile, it might be a co-responder team, or in some circumstances, which is usually less than 1% of the calls, requires life-saving service. This triage language that we're building through Marcus Alert allows us to speak the same language, to know what services are available to that community member, to deploy it to that person as quickly as possible, and integrate it into a, a larger um, 
system of care. So these um, before people would just stop at the call center and receive a referral. Now this is called care traffic control where an individual comes into the system and they're served across in levels one, two, three, and four, and the call center really integrates them together. So it's confusing and it's a lot of moving pieces, um, but there's amazing work going on in Fairfax County that our, our community members will be served better through this integration we look forward to talking about um, as it rolls out. And I pass it back to Lieutenant Morrow. Thank you. So one of the basic tenets of the Marcus Alert Law is that if law enforcement is not needed, then don't send them. Nevertheless, these type of, types of events can be very dramatic, dynamic, they can change quickly, and they can be dangerous to the general public. Therefore, Marxist Alert acknowledges that there are times where, where only mental health professionals or maybe just a phone call might be the most appropriate. Other times when a hybrid approach might be the best approach, for example, co-responder, a law enforcement officer, a law enforcement officer and a trained clinician, and some events where only law enforcement responding is the most appropriate. Essentially, there should not be a one size fits all approach. And because behavioral um, health situations can be different than other public service type events, this dictates that there should be a specialized and systematic response. Next slide, please. What we see here is a graphic representation of the systematic approach that was referred to on the prior slide. In the largest shape, you can see it, it uh, has the word leadership in it. Marcus Alert principles are woven into the fabric of the organization through policies, cultures, tactics, and training. Think of it as becoming part of the DNA of the organization. The next smaller shape mentions basic training and advises that all officers shall receive some level of basic training, at least eight hours. For our department, this will start within the next year. The next smaller sh shape refers to intermediate training. This is the crisis intervention training course that we have now and have had for a number of years. It is a 40 hour course and approximately 42% of our officers have completed this course. And then the smallest shape refers to specialized units and a need for advanced CIT training. This is a new and this is a new course and is reserved for those who served in specialized units, such as CIT or co-responder. It would involve joint training for mental health professionals, dispatchers, officers, and others who deal with behavioral health issues on a daily basis. And I'll pass it back to Lisa. Thank you so much, everyone. Lots of great information. And just to sum up where we are with the Marcus Alert, so far crisis response options have either been identified or developed at each of the four levels that Laura had talked about. And that includes the crisis call center, community response team, mobile crisis units, CR2, REACH, a lot of the mobile response systems that are either in, already in existence or are being developed and enhanced to respond to crisis calls that are related to behavioral health. So as you've seen, a lot of partners are working together to work out how calls can be transferred between public safety dispatch and the regional call center. And that work will really be ongoing over the next several months and, and possibly even longer. Law enforcement policies and trainings have been reviewed to identify what's in place and what may need to be enhanced. And currently public safety, behavioral health teams are working out the logistics of what you've heard about tonight. And all of the partners will continue to work out the processes for Marcus Alert implementation together over the next several months. So what are some next steps for this stakeholders group? Um, one, one thing that everyone can do and, and is encouraged to do is fill out the emergency health profile that Reddick Morris mentioned. Um, the link, well, we're gonna post all of the slides, but if you go to Fairfax County and emergency health profile, you'll be able to find it. 
Um, we will post all the slides from tonight on our Diversion First website. And um, actually, when we go into the breakout groups, we can try to post that link in the chat as well. The other thing that you can do is provide your input. We'd love to hear from you on your thoughts, input on behavioral health responses to behavioral health situations, as well as any other thoughts that you have based on what you've heard in all of the presentations this evening. So what we're gonna do now is, as John mentioned earlier, we are gonna go into the Brave World with Breakout Sessions. We have four separate questions and in just a moment, you're gonna receive a prompt to join one of these groups. The groups will convene for 15 minutes and you'll get a three minute warning when the group is, has three minutes left. And each group has a facilitator and a note taker. So we encourage everyone to attend. If you would prefer not to, you can certainly not select a breakout group and you'll just remain in the virtual lobby. So you'll see four options, question one, two, three, and four. Question one is what aspects of the Marcus Alert are most important to you or the community as a whole? The second question, what do you think would be the biggest benefits of the Marcus Alert system? And, and really feel free to talk about anything that you want to related to the Marcus Alert system. And then the second two questions, number three and number four, number three is ideally what diversion services would you like to see more of in Fairfax County? And question four, how do you think we can improve diversion services in Fairfax County? All right, well then let's, um, th I wanna thank everyone for jumping into the breakouts. It looks like we had almost evenly split breakout sessions, which is a phenomenal achievement because that never happens, uh, but it did. And so that's, that's great. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to facilitate the um, report backs. Sure, thanks, thanks, John. Good to see everyone back. Uh, why don't we just start with group number one, and hopefully you have a designated volunteer who is going to give a quick update on your discussion. We do. We had representation in group number one from both NAMI and our first responder community. So Isha Doshi is going to share the main themes of what we talked about. Thank you. So we did have a great discussion and we had um, quite a few topics come up. Um, the first one was advanced CIT training. We were both discussing um, IDDD and um, neurodivergence. So it was very interesting to see if there if um, neurodivergence would result in a different behavioral health response. Um, the second topic we discussed was a potential county marketing plan um, and what that might look like. Um, and we also discussed voluntary databases and how that might, um, how currently the profiles, the medical health profiles are linked to specific phone numbers. And we were wondering what, um, whether we can pull up profiles, even if somebody is calling from a different phone number. Um, then there was also great interest in bringing all this and great information back to the group. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, group one. So question number two, um, I was in that group. And um, everyone, please chime in if I've missed anything or if I misrepresent anything. But our group talked about some of the benefits of the Marcus Alert. And folks were saying that they thought that it was great to have an alternative crisis response and particularly a coordinated response. Um, certainly um, among different agencies, but across the county, and to be able to coordinate all of the different crisis services that exist now into one cohesive system that uh, folks expressed that they were really happy to see a proactive stance by the state and also the CSBs, and that Marcus Alert was really trying to meet individuals where they are um, physically and emotionally. Um, people really liked that there was a real-time response to crisis and that there would be more options to divert, such as the co-responder team, 
Um, people really liked having the clinician and a law enforcement officer paired together and talk about the benefits of having the clinician be able to have some additional information that may be helpful to providing an intervention. Um, there were some concerns about what the impact would be on call takers. And there was also a note that someone said they hope we hire a lot of mental health professionals to be on lots of teams. So group, did I miss anything that you'd like to add? Okay. So thank you group. So question group number three, do we have a volunteer to report out from group number three? I'm going to go ahead and do that, Lisa. Jason Travis. Thank you, Lieutenant Travis. Good to see you. Thank you. So group number three, our question was uh, ideally, what diversion services would you like to see more of in Fairfax County? And it kind of centered around uh, two main topics, uh, very intertwined. The first one being having uh, robust wraparound services, which was identified that our county does an excellent job uh, with that. Uh, part of that wraparound services is that warm handoff. Uh, that's, you know, the things that were previously discussed, uh, good housing, uh, food services um, come a long way. It's been identified. We've come a long way here in the county with those. Um, but again, it's something that you can't have enough of. So it was really discussed just continually improving that. One of the second topics we discussed kind of goes hand in hand with that was something that's uh, identified as maybe missing or in need of is supporting families of, of their loved one or family member that's incarcerated. Uh, they do have a position, I believe, for that called the Family Support Partners, uh, but that can be something that could be expanded upon. And uh, a lot of people, when that happens to them and uh, their loved one or family member is incarcerated, they don't know what to do a little bit unprepared, uh, don't know where to go uh, for help and resources or expectations, uh, that person or that role would definitely benefit uh, in a professional aspect, would definitely benefit the families because truly, and, and we all know this at the end of the day, the ongoing care is coming from the families uh, more than anything. So they're gonna be there after and have to continue. So family members are in for the long haul and then one of the last things we talked about was part of that warm handoff again, uh, re-entry from jail uh, into the community, the peer support piece um, being very critical as well. And maybe something, again, we can uh, expand or improve upon. And did I miss anything from group three, Linda? Yep, you were spot on. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thank you so much, group three. Group number four, question number four. Do we have a volunteer to report out? Good evening. Yes, this is Ellen Bolow. And group number four's focus was, how do you think we can improve diversion services in Fairfax County? So picking up on the theme um, that was just discussed of kind of the family piece, one of the the elements that was highlighted was kind of the importance of um, helping family members better understand kind of the mental health services that are available to their loved ones when they're incarcerated. So, you know, kind of what type of treatment is being provided, how med medications can continue while someone's incarcerated, um, if that's even possible. So really kind of that education piece for families. Um, and also kind of better, you know, um, better communicating and, and strengthening the connection to mental health services when someone is released from jail. There was also discussion about, um, you know, the importance of engaging people who might be ambivalent about accessing um, or even accepting treatment. Um, and then there was, um, also conversation around kind of how to connect all of the various diversion services into, you know, some of what was presented tonight. So the one example was the, the Chantilly Crisis um, Receiving Center and how, how will that kind of connect into, you know, the, the co-responder piece, the 988 number, all these different initiatives in play and, and just making sure that it's all stays connected. 
Um, and at the same time, the group did discuss kind of the importance of having a lot of options because you really can't have too many options, different pathways for people, depending on kind of where they are um, in their sort of recovery process. Great, thank you so much, Ellen, and thank you to group four and appreciate all of the thinking that folks put into their responses. We are gonna collect the notes from the note takers and we, we do try to incorporate all of your feedback into our next presentation. When we did breakout groups from last year, we, we went back, reviewed the questions and tried to answer as many as we could this time. Um, but since we do have a little bit of time for your questions, in addition to what was discussed in the breakout sessions, I think we can open it up and see if people have anything additional that they want to put into the chat or any questions they want to ask of uh, any of the group members. Lisa, while people are thinking of questions, I'm going to jump in here for a second. And I, I really appreciate the point that... Um, many points, but that the last two groups made about family members and providing information to them. But not only, not only I think in, in the case of those who are incarcerated, but in general, family members trying to support people with a mental health uh, challenge, uh, and maybe they're not incarcerated, but they're in one of our other diversion programs. And, um, and I think that's something, Lisa, that we should talk about in our leadership meeting um, to see where we are in that regard and see whether that's an opportunity for growth. Because I think somebody made the point that, uh, as, as we know, um, much of treatment falls on family members, that, 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 the, that the medical providers do such a great job, but can only go so far and we need family support. So educating the families in how to be supportive, uh, I think that's just a great thought of how we can how we can grow more in that regard. All right, other thoughts, because we do have a few more minutes. Um, I'm not sure if, I think people still might be muted. So the best thing to do if you wanna speak is I think go into the chat and just say, I have a point, or do we have the little wavy hand thing? You can go to reaction, I think, and wave their hand. And uh, Lisa and I will scroll through and see if people have, uh, points that they wish to make. Like the auctioneer, we're going to go once. <laughs> Try not trying to push anyone, but um, but if uh, um, if we have answered questions, uh, then I appreciate that. I want to thank our presenters. I thought we had some excellent presentations. We moved things along, stayed on schedule, which is pretty amazing. Um, and I also uh, appreciate the breakouts. I hope people found the breakout sessions to be helpful. Um, remind everybody that the purpose of this group uh, is not just to be a forum for people to come and listen to what's going on. It's really for uh, members of the community to speak and speak to those in government who are trying to put these programs in place and, and run them. And so um, uh, that is, that's critical and your input is, is critical, maybe more so than you realize um, how not only important is it, but how, how much it's used and the things that are said in these meetings do, do translate into policy as, as we move forward. Um, we will have a survey. Lisa, can you tell yes. us about the survey? Thank you. Thank you, John. Yes, I just posted a link in the chat and it's to a Microsoft form survey. If you click on the link, you can hopefully fill it out tonight. Or if you want to just pull the link off and fill it out tomorrow, we would love to hear from you. And as John just mentioned, your feedback really does make a difference. We want to hear your ideas. We want to hear your thoughts. And we're very interested in your your ideas for future meetings too. Um, whether that be topic areas or things that you think we should be doing more of or less of, we really encourage you to please provide us with some of your, your feedback. So if everyone would complete a survey, that would be fantastic. And hopefully it won't take you but a few minutes. Okay, well with that, we will 
Um, not shut down because I think if we shut down, we cut off your survey. Um, but we will stop speaking and uh, allow each of you to fill out your surveys, encourage you to do that. And um, with that, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we will be in email communication and then meet again in the fall. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.